Hello, everyone, and welcome to the SCA's 43rd monthly Zoom presentation. We're now more than halfway through our fourth year with no end in sight. My name is Brian Gallagher, and I am the Vice President of the Society for Commercial Archaeology. I will be your host tonight. Welcome to all our guests and any new people we have with us tonight. We're happy you took the time out of your late autumn evening to watch an SCA presentation. I hope you will enjoy the show. And for anybody watching the recording of this episode on the S of the SCA's monthly presentations who is not a member of the SCA, we earnestly ask you to consider joining. Funding for the various activities of the SCA comes almost exclusively from our membership. Just visit our website at www.sca-roadside.org and follow the links. Now I have the pleasure of introducing tonight's presentation. Marissa Scheinfeld, author of The Borscht Belt, Revisiting the Remains of America's Jewish Vacation Land, will take us on an illustrated tour of now abandoned sites where resorts, hotels, and bungalow colonies once boomed in the Catskill Mountain region of upstate New York. Scheinfeld, who grew up in the famed region, shot the images inside and outside locations that once buzzed with life as year-round havens for generations of people. She will discuss the rise, fall, and impact of the Borscht Belt, along with the deeper, more layered meaning she finds in her work. She'll also discuss the founding of the Borscht Belt Historical Marker Project, a historical mar marker trail she's working on with a group of historians and artists that commemorates that era. Marissa Scheinfeld's photography has been exhibited nationally and internationally and is among the collections of the Center for Jewish History, the National Yiddish Book Center, the Simon Wiesenthal Center, and the Edmund and Nancy K. Dubois Library at the Museum of Photographic Arts. So without further ado, I'd like to ask Marissa to uh, share her screen with us and give us her presentation. Well, thank you, Brian, for that introduction. And thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. We appreciate your time. Well, um, the Borscht Belt. Um, in an academic and documentative sense, the Borscht Belt is a topic that I've invested in for about 13 years, going on 14 years. It's also quite personal because it's the place that I grew up. This book was a five-year labor of love about the land that I love. It's been out for six years now, and I am deeply appreciative of any time I get to speak about it, because not only is it something that I deeply study, it is something that I'm immensely passionate about. Um, I called the book Revisiting because I love the idea of going back to a place that so many went. Um, and if you've never been to the Borscht Belt, I hope you'll join me tonight on this journey, um, which really is, uh, for me, a lifelong experience, starting with my time there as a child, working in some of the hotels as a teenager, and culminating with that five-year exploration where I uncovered really a larger fascination learning about the reasons of why the Borscht Belt was created and now even in the present day as it has fully faded um, this drive that I have to cement it in stone and etch it forever and that is the historical marker trail. So tonight we're going to go through the rise fall of the Catskills, its impact, um, the images that I made and then I'll lead into the marker project. I'm going to start with a quote by a very um, prominent and impactful photographer was just wonderful in every way, Cartier-Bresson. And he said, photographers deal in things which are continually vanishing. And when they have vanished, there is no contrivance on earth which can make them come back again. The Borscht Belt is located about 90 miles from New York City. That red county highlighted is Sullivan County, which holds the historical heft of what, what once was over 500 hotels, 50,000 bungalows. But the Borscht Belt also included Ulster County um, and even parts of Orange County. And that proximity to New York City is really what allowed it to thrive. My book, that came out in 2016, documented the remains of what I found of, of those 535 hotels and 50,000 bungalows. So in blue were the hotels that I found and in gold were the bungalow colonies. Roughly about 50 to 60 sites were documented in the book. A lot of 
the hotels were repurposed. Some currently are meditation centers, ashrams, hotels in bungalow colonies for Orthodox Jews. Some are secular hotels in bungalow colonies. And there's been a lot of turnover. But when I went through the region, uh, season after season and year after year, I wanted to highlight the hotels that were behemoths, the hotels that were sitting, stagnating, ones that were for sale, ones that were abandoned, and really kind of shed a light on them. Because I knew that seeing them as these crumbling palaces in a way, uh, they were going to eventually not be there. And looking at this map now, over half of the sites in the book and the images that I will show you are completely gone with no trace left. The Borscht Belt was known as this real place of leisure, this land of entertainment, this place where community was forged and culture was uh, coveted. And um, there's so much that came out of it. Um, but we're gonna start in this simple, beautiful road here, which was the hotel bungalow billboard signage that one might have seen while driving up Route 17 in 1965. The Browns, the Windsor, the Pines, the Hayden, the Aladdin, the Avon, Gilberts, Majestic, Levitt, all of these places, uh, which to those of you that have been might evoke your imagination. And to those of you that haven't, uh, these were really kind of the markers of what made up this grand Jewish American vacation land. The Borscht Belt was a year round vacation destination. So it was very busy in the winter, but it was also predominantly, uh, you know, packed and booming in the summer. Um, it brought people together. People went year after year. Um, it, uh, pushed industry and economy and commerce, um, as well as leaving this really amazing legacy, uh, which we will go through tonight. In uh, the Imperial Room up on the left here, that was the largest showroom in the United States when it was built. It seated over 3,000 people. Uh, the Neville also had a tremendous theater and entertainment and comedy and um, really uh, arts and theater were a huge part of the Borscht Belt, in addition to the nightlife and the activity that went on and the sense of community and culture. And this is a wonderful brochure, Sullivan County, number one in the nation for a zestful, restful vacation. And I quite love that. Um, my grandparents met in the Borscht Belt when my grandmother was hitchhiking and my mom, that was my dad's side and my mom's parents went on their honeymoon there. So as a child, I always heard tall tales of the region. My parents moved up there in 1985 and still make their home there. And I always heard these stories and, and this is why I show this slide. It's always fun time. And all of those stories were fun. They were vivacious. They were lively. They painted a scene of glamour and glitz and friendship and laughs and um, really everything that was joyful. Um, and once I started this project, that's where I began. But I really needed to understand why the board spelt was created, why these hotels look like the way they did. And that's how I started to trace um, the history of it. So I'm going to lead you through and we're going to start at the very beginning. The land that the Borscht Belt is, is present-day Lenape Indian Territory. These are some drawings made by uh, not the Lenape Indian tribe, but the Lenape Indian tribe uh, has a vast territory that covers present-day New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. And this is a map just showing you, and it stretches right up through the Catskills and the Borscht Belt. Around the 1700s, 1800s, uh, European settlers heard of the rumored riches of the Catskills, and I'm not speaking about money, uh, I'm speaking about timber and lumber and proximity to New York City and industry. So um, this is an early drawing that predates uh, really photography or early photography, 1856. You have to think of a very rocky, mountainous, rugged region. It was inaccessible. There were really no major roadways. There was no railroad. There was certainly no highway. But European, Dutch, and German settlers came into the area and they built what was the first major industry and the Borscht Belt's the third. So I'm gonna go through the first two just to paint a picture and a scene for you. And that was the lumber industry. So the trees were cut down, they were logged and they were pushed down the Delaware River. And these trees built New York City, 
Philadelphia, and they created a very early uh, springing up of restaurants and inns that were mainly for workers. What happened eventually are those trees and the natural resources became depleted from the landscape. And the next industry that sprung up was the tanning industry around the time of the Civil War. And it said that Sullivan County um, tanned uh, leather during the Civil War. And one of the most, uh, you know, the biggest output came from Sullivan County. And they used the bark from trees. And this was one of the tanneries powered by a waterfall. With the tanneries uh, started to become a little bit more foot traffic and people now had heard about the region. And one of the earliest visitors to the Catskills were fly fishermen. And these are some pictures of fly fishing up on the Beaver Kill River and the Beaver Kill Inn, which is still there. This is an early painting called Asher Duran's Kindred Spirits made in 1849. And this is of Catterskill Falls. Uh, this, this painting has become an icon of American landscape painting, not only showing the majestic beauty of the Catskills, but the painting has many pieces of memento mori and ideas of uh, nature and how we try to understand it and grasp it, but can't, um, and how it can be beautiful and also kind of dangerous and intimidating at the same time. So we're kind of going through history here and we're in about 1900. So like most of the United States, Sullivan County caught railroad fever and the railroads were built around this time, boosted by the railroads, that tourism trade that began with fishermen and artists and writers began to blossom. And once a very desolate industrial region, which had a lumber and then a tanning industry, Sullivan County slowly began became a tourist destination. It offered its visitors fresh air, clean water, and a place of entertainment. And this is an early postcard greetings from the Catskill Mountains, the best place on earth. Another image here of the Kayamisha Casino circa 1900. The first visitors uh, to uh, Sullivan County were, were not Jews. Um, they were uh, mainly Gentiles coming up to the area in 1907. This is the regatta at White Lake. And a lot of these images I found on the Catskill Institute and they helped to piece together a timeline for me about what the history of that region was. So around 1910, um, many sanitariums started to spring up and these were places where people that had tuberculosis went. And the idea was that you can alleviate the symptoms of the disease by going and breathing and inhaling in the fresh air. But locals didn't like that the region was becoming known as a haven for the sick. So there was a lot of pressure put on the sanitarium owners to close and many of them did. In addition, the polio epidemic struck and people were told to avoid large crowds, public places and spaces. And as a result, this kind of destination that had a connection to New York City, that had accessibility, became very quiet. Uh, somewhere that already had a little bit of um, hotels and foot traffic um, became something that now was a bit empty. So here we have the stage is set for the Borschbalb, but it's very important for me to share truly why it was created. In the first half of the 20th century, discrimination against Jews was widespread and accepted in American society. Jews in the United States were often excluded from housing, employment, educational, legal opportunities, in addition to being barred from participating in social circles, social club membership, and vacation access. And this is a magazine distributed called Jew Jokes, 1908. This is a illustration and it says the stranger at our gate. It shows a picture of a Jew toting Sabbath desecration, anarchy, um, superstition, poverty, and disease coming in with an image of Uncle Sam holding his nose in disgust. Immigrant says, can I come in? And Uncle Sam says, I suppose there's no law to keep you out. After fleeing anti-Semitism, pogroms, and genocide in Europe, Jews continued to face that upon their arrival to the United States and in Canada. Anti-Semitism reached its peak in the 1920s, and that is just around the time of the dawn of the Borscht Belt. Common signage of the time said, Gentiles only, no Jews, Jews not allowed, Christians only, Jews danger. At the time, KKK membership had reached 4 million, and there were discrimination, discriminatory immigration policies that were enacted, favoring immigrants from Northern and Western Europe over other parts of the world. 
as opposed to Eastern Europe, where many Jews came from. This is a brochure that comes from the Craigsmore Inn, which is on the Schwangunk Mountains in just outside of Allenville. And it's seemingly a beautiful brochure, entrance gate to the Craigsmore Inn, 1910. And if you tune in to the left side of the screen, owning to neighborhood preferences, Hebrews are requested not to apply. So there it is in ink. Um, and I've seen many documents uh, that say, you know, dear Mr. Silverberg, we do not employ your kind um, and other brochures that clearly shun Jews from going. So as a result, a publication came out called the Jewish Farmers Almanac, and it advertised a section in the back that was called Jewish Vacation Guide, hotels, boarding houses and rooming houses where Jews were welcome. And these are some clips from the inside of it. It not only showed um, uh, rooming houses and hotels, but also banks and gas stations and places where you can fix your car that accepted Jews and it was a safe place for Jews to go. The guide became a green book, uh, the model for the green book, which was used by the African American community um, in 1936. And when considering these guides, it's really important to recognize the hate that has been perpetuated over time. And as a result, conceived of destinations of refuge for not only the Jewish community, but for the black, Hispanic, gay, disabled, and other minority communities who have all faced degrading marginalization. And this is a topic that I'm working on in my next book that will be coming out hopefully in the next year or so. But out of this exclusion, became a group that said, hey, you don't want us to be part of your club? Well, we're gonna make our own space and we're gonna carve out our own place. And that's what happened. And the Borscht Belt was born out of a need for refuge, grew a renaissance, and it was a promised land that offered acceptance, community, tradition, leisure, and culture. Many um, Jewish investors and entrepreneurs, largely in New York City at the time, recognized that there was this influx of Jews coming who wanted to experience what the American dream was, but were shut out. So they began to purchase properties in the region, specifically small farms, boarding houses, and hotels. And this is how the Borscht Belt was created. And here is an early postcard made by a photographer named Otto Hillig, who did a wonderful Wonderful, wonderful um, kind of um, scanning of that of the Catskills around this time and his left behind just an amazing treasure trove of images and many postcards. But this is Grossinger's. Grossinger's was one of the biggest hotels in the Borscht Belt, and it started as a farmhouse. And this is from 1914 to 1919. The Grossinger family lived in this farmhouse, and the uh, earth is never really so good for farming up in the Catskills. So what these uh, early hoteliers realized was that they could take in boarders to supplement their income. And that's exactly what they did. Grossinger's eventually moved to this hotel called the Nichols, which before the Grossinger's family took it over, was a hotel that did not allow Jews. And this is the original main building and Grossinger's staff. Grossinger's was kind of like the giant of the Borscht Belt. Their slogan was Grossinger's had everything, and it really did. It had an Olympic swimming pool. It had its own airport. It had its own zip code. It had an indoor Olympic-sized swimming pool, an outdoor Olympic-sized swimming pool. Um, but there were so many other hotels, and I'm um, going to try to touch on a bunch of them. The Hotel Zeiger, each had its own its aesthetic design, a mid-century palette with arches and shapes and organic shapes and colors and textures. And uh, this is the Concorde. This staircase was built really just for, for browsing and for looking, and it was created by Morris Lapidus, who was an unbelievable architect who went on to build the Fountain Blue and many hotels across America, including Las Vegas. The Falls View, another hotel, and I truly love this postcard because it shows not only the uh, aesthetic and that mid-century architecture, which the Borscht Belt was so known for, but it shows the beautiful backdrop of the Catskills in the back and the mountains, and then in the foreground, people coming together and um, that sense of connection and that fun that they were having there. This is the Olympic pool and poolorama at the Laurels. Each hotel had a different theme. The Laurels was a singles hotel and uh, someone that worked there told me the slogan was go to the Laurels and lose your morals. 
This is live, love, and be happy at Hotel Evans on Lake Evans with the aqua solaria and the band playing poolside. And you can sit and listen to a band and then take a dip in the pool. And it really was a piece of paradise. This is the Shawanga Lodge in Highview, circa 1950s. My favorite part of the Shawanga Lodge, if you look to the left, is the outdoor amphitheater. How phenomenal and gorgeous that is. This is Esther Manor. So there were all different hotels, different price points, kosher, non-kosher, kosher style, five-star, four-star, three-star. Um, and each hotel really catered to, um, you know, bringing in as many guests, bringing in different acts. This is Charles and Lillian Brown's hotel. This was where the famous Jerry Lewis Theater was, a uh, comedy center. Um, this is another image here, just kind of showing you the uh, daytime as well as the nighttime activities. And this is the laurels. Uh, what I love about this postcard is if you look at the people standing in the row, uh, the man in the green jacket on the right, that is my friend's father. And he worked at the hotel. And I, the story she told me is he was pulled into the picture at the last minute because the photographer felt the balance was off on the postcard and uh there my friend Devin's dad uh, is immortalized um and there's so many amazing uh, stories that I found and people that I've met who said oh that is my mother in that postcard and that always energizes me I love this one uh, outdoor sunbathing in winter at Grossinger's then there are the hoteliers themselves. Arthur Winterick, who is uh, the man that started and led the Concord, and Jenny Grossinger, who was really like the femme fatale of uh, Grossingers, who ran it all. Um, you know, women are often uh, an untapped, uh, ignored part of what made the Borscht Belt really run because it was also built on the backs of women who were the hostesses, who kept things going, who brought the warmth. Um, and you can find many women, uh, Jenny Grossinger, Helen Kutcher, um, the um, Esther Manor were two sisters, um, Carrie Comito, uh, so many different women. And she was at the Aladdin, so many different women helped to run the Borscht Belt. It really was, they were ahead of their time. And then there were the, the icons, like Lou Simon says Goldstein, who was a tumbler. A tumbler is sort of like an MC. They are the people in the hotels that get you excited to be at the hotel. And he was known for Simon Says, and that's him in 1985. In addition, food was a huge part of the Borscht Belt experience. It was an all-you-can-eat experience. Um, this is table 89, full of food. You can send it back if you didn't like it and keep ordering and ordering more. And I love this photograph because there's so many different personal dynamics going on between the nose blowing and people laughing and someone almost choking. And um, this is made by Ken Regan around the 1980s in Kutcher's. This is a Mahjong game, 1955, by a bunch of uh, women here outside of Port Jervis at Green's Lakeside Hotel. So in addition to the food and the nightlife and the people that came, there was also the people that made it run. And this is just the staff of the dining room at Kutcher's. Um, and it's really important to note the locals were the ones and the people whose livelihood, whose uh, economy and whose, uh, you know, pockets, um, paid their bills and put their children through school and how really the Borscht Belt was this economic machine that ran through or uh, the Catskills. This is a menu at the Nemerson Hotel. And I think I saw Stacy Nemerson here at the talk, who's a descendant of that hotel. And this is from July 29, 1969. And all the hotels would have these menus. At the top would be a graphic um, color, sometimes an etch sketch, uh, sometimes a little icon. The Nemerson had that penguin. And on the left would say, good afternoon. And the five types of soup and the five entrees and the cold plates and the dessert. And on the right, everything that the hotel offered that day, indoor pool, a happening, which always sounds really excellent with Murray Waxman, bingo, arts and crafts, swim, and then make your nightclub reservation at night. In addition to the hotel story, there is an immense bungalow story. Um, you know, the Borscht Belt is a thing that it's hard to get through in 40 minutes, but I'm going to try my best to just touch on a bit of everything. But so many different bungalow colonies. And this is Slavin's, Wiss Wigwam, and Rosenberg's. 
this is a postcard of a bungalow colony called Bardo's College uh, Cottages in Monticello in 1950. And this is probably one of my favorite images that I found in the Catskills Institute. It's just these four women sitting in the sun in a bungalow colony around 1940 in Monticello. This is also important to mention, not everyone could afford a hotel or to go to a bungalow for the entire summer. So there was another option called a cook -a -lane. And a cook -a -lane means cook alone. Uh, it's a boarding house, and this is one on Kutcher Road, where living and cooking space were shared, and each family was responsible for their own meals. So women would share a kitchen, and that was like, cook it yourself, cook it alone. Uh, and that was another option that the Borscht Belt offered. These are my grandparents who met in the Catskills. These are my other grandparents who went to the Catskills uh, additionally for about 50 years. Uh, so going through my own family archives was really important. And that's me with my grandpa rowing at Kutcher's. Uh, and when I think of the Catskills, my memories are full. Um, in the book that I wrote, it starts with the one and only thing that came to my mind uh, when I uh, began to piece it together. And I say, I grew up in the mountains or as others called it, the country, as if no other country or place existed on earth. Um, and it really did feel like it was the epicenter and the center of the universe. And I think for a time and for a great number of people, it's, it's really a, a declaration of truth. This is the dizzy correspondence card for the very busy traveler who could just check off uh, their experience in the Borscht Belt and then mail it away. And so many towns did these reproduce, and this was Swan Lake. Uh, you can't talk about the Borscht Belt without talking about its celebrity presence from Paul Newman, Frank Sinatra, Sammy Davis Jr., Louis Armstrong. Who else do we have here? Elizabeth Taylor and Eddie Fisher with Eddie uh, uh, with Jenny Grossinger. There's Duke Ellington again on the keys and Eddie Fisher behind him. Eleanor Roosevelt walking down the lobby with Jenny Grossinger and Dr. Martin Luther King, who spoke at a rabbinical conference 10 days before he was assassinated. And there he is with Rabbi Everett Gendler, who brought him and invited him. And these two were great friends. Gendler marched with King during the civil rights uh, movement. This is Golda Meir sitting in the dining room in Israel. The Catskills also had a huge sports legacy, and you have Floyd Patterson, Rocky Marciano, Wilt Chamberlain, Muhammad Ali, all these boxers trained up in the Catskills would go up there during the off season, um, would spar, they would bring in press, um, and Wilt Chamberlain was a, a bellhop at Kutcher's before he rose to NBA fame. The Catskills also was the breeding ground and a training camp for those in comedy and faces in these uh, uh, photographs are ones that I think, you know, um, resonate to the present day. We have Sid Caesar, Toady Fields, Freddie Roman, Rodney Dangerfield, Henny Youngman, Mel Brooks, Woody Allen. Uh, up at the top right is Marilyn Michaels. Joan Rivers, a household name. Jerry Seinfeld, uh, equally a household name. Uh, I remember seeing billboards for Seinfeld when I was a kid, and this was before he got his spot on the syndicated talk show. And I think, you know, Joan Rivers, the most of all, at least for me, is someone that I greatly miss. Uh, she always spoke so wonderfully about her time in the Catskills. This is Mel Brooks' notes. He started as a comedian at age 14 at the Butler Lodge, and these were his jokes uh, where he was trying out uh, his act. And it's hard to decipher, but he was talking about an egg and tomato, transformer, a pot of gold, something stopped short, and three chorus girls. These are Rodney Dangerfield's notes from the mountains. Rodney Dangerfield also started as a teen comedian. And by the time he was 29, he had a horrible act in the Catskills uh, or a few that made him quit and go into the painting business for many years. And it took a few decades for Rodney Dangerfield to come back. And eventually this is an ad for him in the seventies when he had already become a household name. Rodney Dangerfield, I don't get no respect at the Raleigh. And I love that, how so many people really told their worst jokes, bombed, um, you know, uh, 
felt like they were a failure and then just rose up um, and became really known uh, not beyond the Borscht Belt in American popular culture as well. And that's really where the Borscht Belt crosses over to so many that didn't know anything about it is really in that entertainment world. This is a, a movie that was filmed. Um, this is actually a mistake. It was filmed at the Concord. Um, and this is with Alan Arkett and Elliot Gould on the set of Little Murders made by a very prominent, wonderful photographer named Mary Ellen Mark, arguably one of the greatest documentary photographers of this century. This is a singles weekend at the Concord. Uh, as the hotels kind of started waning, uh, singles weekends were things that got people to come back. Um, and I love these images because they're very 1980s and paint a picture of that uh, that time where people were coming, um, but people eventually stopped coming. And these are images made by John Margulies. Margulies came through the Catskills in the late seventies. He photographed some of the hotel owners, but also what he has left behind are these images of the hotel in pristine condition, but very few guests, if any. And this is kind of where the end of the Borscht Belt uh, you know, really is cemented. These are all headlines, 1998. In the Catskills Resort's death darkens view. Our towns are tradition and a resort at twilight. Grossinger's closed during Passover. Hotels sold. The hills were alive. There are many different theories and theses of why the Borscht Belt ended. Some say it was the boom of the airline industry, the boom of the cruise industry, the proliferation of the suburbs. People didn't have to go up to the Catskills. Um, some say it was the changing role of women entering the workforce, the dynamics, home dynamics. Others say it was the 1960s, a very intense decade in America where you have the civil rights movement, women's lib, the sexual revolution, the war in Vietnam, and such immense change going on in America that the Catskills stayed the same. And a lot of people chose to move on. It's also really important to say that in 1965, the Anti-Discrimination Act was signed. So Jews and minorities who were not able to frequent American establishments were now allowed to. And this is when historians say the true turning point of the Borscht Belt uh, starts to go on its real decline is at that moment. And in many ways, it really does make sense. Um, people went to places now where that they were formerly shut out of. And the Borscht Belt's left behind a huge legacy. There's lots of books and memoirs and archival piecing together of photographs, all that I've studied and all of, uh, I recommend if you're ever interested in reading more. Um, Phil Brown is a huge name, as well as Sullivan County historian, John Conway, who is a mentor of sorts, as well as the Fromer's book, Phenomenal, and Stephen Canford's book. In addition, it's been immortalized in so many movies, but Dirty Dancing, A Walk on the Moon, Sweet Lorraine, and Mr. Saturday Night is another one. Um, but, you know, growing up there, um, leaving there uh, in uh, after college, and then finally kind of uh, looking back to it as I was looking for a project uh, and something to photograph, I got the advice, shoot what you know. And uh, that was really the impetus for how the project started. I knew my hometown had this tremendous history and and it was fading. And um, I knew something inside of me told me that this is what I needed to photograph. So I started with re-photography, which is the act of repeat photography. It's an image made at the same site with a time lag. So it's a now and then. I would take a postcard like this at the laurels and I would go to the laurels and I would piece them together so that they laid side by side. And this was like a treasure map. I'd find a postcard of the skating rink. I'd go to the skating rink and see what it looked like. And then I'd piece them together. Um, the skating rink on the right looks a lot colder than the skating rink on the left. There's these skeletal remains, but this was a now and then. This started to kind of, uh, send light bulbs in my head about time. What happens over time? How do things change? What remains the same? What is constant and what is unidentifiable? And this is again, the laurels. What slowly happened was, is that I deviated from that now and then, but the book starts with that now and then, because what would transpire would be, I'd go to Grossinger's and I'd realize there was more of a story to tell than that now and then, which in a way put me in a box, but allowed me to at least have a jumping off point. Um, and this is Grossinger's sold in 89, 
was abandoned and laid there until 2019. Um, up a disused driveway lie a carport that was unfinished as well as a lobby. And it felt like the hotel was almost being eaten by mother nature. And I was on this quest to just find any trace or remnant of the Borscht Belt that I could, stairs. And that was all that was left of the Tansville Hotel, which burned in a fire. But these stairs just seemed so strong, like they had persevered despite all odds. The Paramount, Paramount Hotel in Parksville, um, which was for sale and I believe still is. Um, and any kind of piece that I could uh, kind of like put together as this tapestry as what was left was what I was just on a mission, shuffleboard courts. And I remember playing shuffleboard as a kid. So some of the images were driven by my own memories, but a lot of them were driven by this desire to capture what I knew the Borscht Belt to be. And of course, theaters, the Stardust Room at the Nebuli at Ellenville. I remember I was lucky enough to, to meet Gilbert Gottfried and he told me that he uh, was laughed off of this stage. And uh, it's just these funny anecdotes, um, you know, that kind of happen where um, you just realize like how impactful that era was and how many people um, kind of grew out of that. Um, there's also these unknown places that have never been marked. And this is a casino somewhere in Liberty on a windy country road that was never identified. This is Hotel Leroy, which is on the grounds of the community college in Sullivan County. And this was all that was left of the Hotel Leroy. So I started to see this sense of entropy, the sense of abandonment, these two lights in a guest room devoid of a bed. Um, and that entropy and that abandonment was astounding in a way. It was like, whoa, how did this happen? And how did this like get here? And why is this still here? And why is this place not being used? And this is the Tamarack, which when I found it, uh, this was the only part of the hotel that had not burned in a fire. The Tamarack is now completely gone. This is Cooper's Sunrise Bungalow Colony in Rock Hill. And I love these bungalows. They felt like a bungalow should be a little bit worn, homey, kind of rickety, creaky, but um, it had that beautiful sunlight. Um, and these bungalows, every time I drive by them, someone is fixing them. So it's like with the Borscht Belt, and making the book, I never knew what I would find. And even going there today, because my parents still live there, I still drive by things and I'm always amazed at what I keep finding. Um, I don't move anything, I don't touch anything. This book was made with this sense of photography being um, a very documentative. I didn't want to manipulate. I think photography can be incredibly manipulating. It is one of its downfalls. And as a result, these were all still lives that I found. They were left up to the people, mother nature, time, chance, anyone else or any other force. Um, and I would just go in and maneuver my body to get the framing that I wanted. Um, in addition to the abandonment, I saw this really apocalyptic scene. And again, I don't construct. So finding this kitchen with the pots and pans stacked up was very surreal. In addition to a laundry room at Grossinger's full of sheets. I'm shooting with a Pentax 645. If anyone's interested, it's a medium format camera. I think film yields itself to truer color. It also slows me down. Digital photography, I think you can take hundreds of images where film you have 16 shots on a roll and you really have to contemplate and think. This was the Black Magic showroom at the Commodore in Swan Lake and all the chairs were taken out and thrown in the back. In the book, there's, there's the chairs. I don't have that here, but you can see what this room has become, which is a skate park. So this peculiar repurposing also was something that I saw that kept me going and uh, in, in awe and wonder. A dining room with its hot pink chairs that had turned into a paintball battlefield. Another peculiar repurposing. But you know, when I was 16, I remember every single hotel had closed by that point. There was nothing to do up there. The movie theater had closed. There was really limited. The Chinese restaurant and the bagel bakery, and it was a quite desolate area. So when I found these places and these skate parks and these paintball rooms, it was not lost on me why it was created, um, you know, for the need to have that recreation. And although not intended to be a paintball battlefield, the pines ended up being one. And this is the lobby at Grossinger's that uh, 
really uh, what was happening here was that Grossinger's went bankrupt and they started uh, a new project, got some money and built a new lobby thinking that they were going to reopen and the hotel closed. So if you look at the top of the frame, you can see they started to paint it this peach. And if you move your eyes down to the bottom of the frame, you see the spackling and the job that was never finished, but eventually finished by uh, people who went in there to graffiti. Um, Again, no staging, uh, found this and, you know, the book is definitely melancholy and there's a pathos that runs through the project and a sadness about the inevitable kind of end of the Borscht Belt, but finding these scenes that made me laugh, you know, who set up table 12 with fake napkins and glasses and fruit. Um, and again, it is against my photographic religion to manipulate and um, finding these scenes, just put a little humor in a book that I think needed a tiny dose. Um, other images to me were constructed in a way where I found these chairs and just went in front of them with my camera and I looked at them and it felt like a conversation was happening or had just happened. And, you know, these are not just like physical places where memories were created, um, but there's all of these details that come through here, you know, the birds, uh, the turning over the cycle um, and all of these little oddities and these peculiar things, um, the indoor pool at Grossinger's. This was one of the most unbelievable rooms I had ever been in. And um, it was just miraculous and majestic um, and is now completely gone. But these four chairs sitting there in this beautiful room with this gorgeous light um, really kind of symbolized that vacation for me. Then I also started to see the remnants of people. Um, but if you look straight back, you see that beautiful lush red curtain, um, but beyond it, there's peeling paint, there's graffiti, there's vandalism, but there's also this other theme that I found called Mother Nature. Uh, she was really engulfing the palms that day and you can only see the word S in the name palms, which was formerly called El Z the Zyger and then before that called the El Dorado Hotel. And now there are condos there. And it took a long time for me to kind of understand why I was even making the book. This is the lobby at Esther Manor overgrown in, in a carpet of moss. A lot of times people would say, well, why are you going there? There's nothing there. And over and over, I heard, you know, there's nothing there. And uh, it took a long time for me to be able to say, well, you're not looking. Um, because to me, not only are there personal histories here, but there's collective histories and greater histories and many different narratives. A guest room at the Jenny G building, she was the matriarch of Grossinger's. Uh, so she had her own building. Uh, and the bird, among many birds that I found flying through, it was a sanctuary of birds. And this was the only one that I was able to capture. Um, and then you see that beautiful leaf growing up from the ashes of the fire. Um, and I love that image. This image is the cover of the book. I knew that it would be the cover as soon as I shot it. It depicts this paradise lost um, this vacation land uh, with this pristine chair that feels like it's it's in perfect condition. But if you look around, you see literally inches and inches of a moss carpet inside. Other images evoke different narratives for me, like this one for me was Sleeping Beauty. Uh, these vines draping over the outdoor pool at Perlin's bungalow colony like a canopy and someone threw dirt into this pool in a way like they tried to like erase it but it it's still there so every year I drive by and she just flowers in the summer and it's one of my favorite pools to go see this is the guest room at the Tamarack. The phone off the bed is a narrative in itself. I also just love the colors. Again, shooting with uh, film, I think it's truer in color and detail, and then I scan it and it also slows me down. Um, and other symbols like this elevator shaft at the Tamarack, one of the only parts to not um, be ravaged by a fire and how strong that elevator shaft was. Um, in the book, Jenna Weissman Jocelyn, who's an, a historian, um, a professor, and she writes for the forward, she called this like a totem pole. 
And it was around that time when I read Jenna's essay that it dawned on me that there was really no totem poles or markers to indicate where the Borscht Belt happened. Um, I have a few more images to show you before I get to the marker project, but these icons bowl a bowling alley with that globe. It really looks like the earth. Uh, a book, a prayer book that was just discarded and left open at the Homoac in Spring Glen. Poker chips and cards discarded in addition to checks. It was almost in some cases like people really fleed and just left everything. It, it felt very eerie. Uh, ice skates at the Homoac Lodge just cast aside on the side of the ring. I went and it was really important to document in all seasons, even though the Borscht Belt was known as a summer retreat, uh, going in all seasons provided different colors and textures and shapes and forms. In addition, going to hotels that were undergoing their own stresses. And this was the Browns, which had a fire. Uh, it was condominiums and people were forced to leave their homes. And I believe there is currently a lawsuit still going on many years later at the Browns but I needed to have the Browns in the book and I was approved just to go about this far. And you can see in the background that the water was being sprayed still as the fire was being put out. This is the Neville, which has undergone many different hands and many different owners. It currently has an owner who has plans for it. Um, it's something that like we all hope for. Um, and um, I'll, when I see it, I'll believe it. Um, but um, this is an unbelievable skating rink. It has this pagoda style architecture. It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, and what's so unfortunate is that I see pictures of the Neville today and uh, my images make it look pristine. And today it's literally hanging by a thread. Uh, bungalows at breezy corners. When I went there that day, these were actually being demolished. Um, and it was just part of the process, really investing myself there for just time. Um, and I was able to photograph breezy corners when it was demolished to build what is now a casino at uh, what is called Resorts World Catskills. This is the Concord, which was also demolished, sold at auction, used as a fireman's training camp. And uh, if you've ever been to the Concord, it had these iconic pine trees that lined the driveway in and out. And that was where I went as a kid. My grandpa would play cards there. So making this image for me kind of pulled me in a very weird emotional headspace as opposed to the others, which were more creative and intellectual, I'd like to think. Um, and this was very much like I could not find my grounding because it felt like a wreckage, um, like an earthquake in not only outside, but inside. And this is the Concord uh, as it remains, this scar in a way, um, you know, post Borscht Belt, it, the county has really struggled to find an identity, but there are so many new spaces and places popping up in Sullivan County and Ulster County that I encourage you to go there if you haven't been there in a while. And these are the last two images. And this symbolically is this fern growing out of this old pool, which to me is like this... Um, turning of the tides, uh, something new sprouting out of the old. And um, that's at the Rosemont Hotel in Woodridge. And this is the last image, the coffee shop at Grossinger's, which really without the counter signals that like ending of that empire and of that era. And in many ways, the book is an elegy. Um, it's a sad tribute, uh, but at the same time, it is what I see as celebration. So um, there is this sense of beauty in, in the ruin, if you will. Um, I think it was natural for me to uh, stay in that Borschfeld conversation after this book came out. Um, it's something that I'm very passionate about. And I received a generous offer from the, a man named Jerry Klinger. Uh, he runs the Jewish American Society for Historic Preservation, and they fund historic markers all over the United States, in the UK, and in Israel. And Jerry uh, offered to fund a historic marker trail. And um, that's what I'm doing now in addition to being a mom of two uh, and working on another book, um, I feel like someone needs to do this. So I put together a team and we're doing this. And we are the Borscht Belt Historical Marker Project. 
We established ourselves last year as an initiative dedicated to the preservation of the entire era. We consider its impact on American Jewish life, Catskill legacy, New York state history, and American culture. Our mission is to create a marker system of 20 historic markers coupled with an array of programming that's easily accessible by the public and benefits the communities in which they are placed. That's one of our markers there, but I'll show you more up close. It's gonna be a large scale trail and inclusive of all the towns where Borscht Belt hotels and bungalow colonies once existed. When complete, not yet, I'm aiming for the end of 2025, early 2026, realistically. It will be united by a self-guide audio driving tour where you can take multiple different routes narrated by multiple different people, both known and, um, local um, and you can hear about the history and these are our markers um, some of them are on and some of them are near sites of significant events or historic properties our goal is to select the the location that makes the most sense and illuminate the history in the present day they're adorned with photographs, which I think makes them much more palatable. They have QR codes placed next to them, um, and they're placed in public places and public spaces, not on roadsides where unfortunately I think historic markers in a way um, make it less appealing for people to stop because there's often not a safe pull-off spot. It was very intentional for us to put these in existing public places and have people faced with them rather than having to always find them. Um, so we hope our project is historic as well as immersive with the QR codes and the photographs um, and really that it educates people not only about the past, but all the events that shape it and how the past really has its imprint still on the present of that region. And they're all gifts to the community. Uh, the Jewish American Society for Historic Preservation funds every single one, and their aesthetic is, is very big. They're 30 by 42. They're bigger than the average New York State marker. Uh, they're vibrant blue and tan. They're homage to uh, the mid-century colors, and the fact that they have photographs, for me as a visual person, I think just allow the story to be told so much more. And then you scan the codes, they bring you to our website. There's lots of stories, extended stories about the towns, the hotels, the bungalow colonies. We actually list every single hotel and bungalow colony on record in each town on our website, in addition to more videos and images. And our goal is not only to attract those who experience the era, but I honestly, truly, and more importantly for me are people that know nothing about it. Um, and in a way we're translating this history uh, via a multitude of mediums um, and hoping that um, these markers really outlive me. That that really is my mission. Um, the group is administered. Uh, I'm spearheading the project, but I have, it takes a village, locals, historians, and artists who are truly dedicated to identifying and commemorating this era. And I'm proud to call these people my friends. Um, and as I mentioned, there was not one historical marker to commemorate the Borscht Belt before we started. So it feels really important. And uh, at this current moment, it feels more important than ever, this project for me. Um, our project also addresses the need for tolerance and compassion for all. By using these codes, new new media, old media, historic markers, we really want to attract everyone and um, we want to make it adventurous, combining history and encouraging people to experience the towns, uh, to go to the towns, to spend their dollars in the towns. And in a, a way, we hope the project helps with tourism. Each marker dedication, we try to bring people associated with the hotels and the bungalows as well. So on the left, we had Zach Kutcher speak, who is the grandson of uh, Helen Kutcher and Milton Kutcher, whose uh, grandparents started the hotel. In the middle, uh, we have a woman named Marilyn Silfen, whose family owned the El Dorado. And on the right, filmmakers who made a documentary about Kutcher's. And in the middle, Celia Duffy, who was the famed ice skating queen at Kutcher's. So we really tried to bring a, a really curated, uh, thoughtful program to all of our dedications. And each dedication has some kind of an event uh, designed to foster inquiry, promote dialogue, and bring community together. We have film screenings, exhibits. We hope to do bus tours next summer, author and literary events, comedy. We've done a concert. 
We're going to make a curricula for students and then eventually the audio driving tour. This is my last slide. Um, more than historic markers, we have a diverse range of initiatives. And overall, we have a much greater long term vision for the Borscht Belt. Um, while our markers are generously funded by the Jewish American Society for Historic Preservation, we are appreciative of any donations um, because we have free programs. They will always be free. They will always be offered to the community and especially communities that need these programs. Um, and uh, really, uh, the reception has just been so beautiful. We've seen so many old friends and so many new friends um, and just... Um, it's been a wonderful thing uh, to be involved in, and I encourage you to come up. We have four markers in the ground. By next uh, Memorial Day, we'll start with six more dedications in 2024, and by the end of the summer, we will have 10 historic markers, and I hope the following year we'll have uh, 20. Um, so I thank you so much for spending your evening with me. If you're interested in purchasing my book, The Borscht Belt, it's available almost everywhere, your local independent bookstore to the big box, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, um, and uh, borschtbeltbook.com is the website. And the Borscht Belt Historical Marker Project has a really fun website. You can't forget it. May the Borscht be with you. Um, and we're very active on social media, trying to really create a platform to share that history um, and uh, thank you for sharing your evening with me. I appreciate your time very much. Well, thanks so much, Marissa. That was an, <clears throat> excuse me, absolutely top-notch presentation. Uh, we have uh, an extensive number of chats uh, or comments in the chat, all of them highly complimentary, uh, which I'll be forwarding on to you. And for those of you that are interested in purchasing the book or making a donation, you will be receiving an email after the presentation this evening uh, with those links in it again. So you'll have easy access to uh, both a site where you can make a contribution or a site where you can purchase Marissa's book. Now we've, we're running a little bit late Marissa, but we have a bunch of questions as well. So I'm going to go through them uh, relatively quickly if we can. And um, the first one is actually from uh, Nancy Sturm, who was a past president of our, uh, of our association, and uh, I'm going to ask her to uh, to um, <clears throat> to unmute herself and ask the question directly. She also has a little story to tell about the Porsche Bell. Nancy, are you there? Yes, yes, I am. Marissa, I want to thank you for this presentation. Um, it is just so deeply meaningful to me. I can't seem to make my my video go, but um, I I identify with your sense of mourning about the loss of this. And I thank you for doing the work and pushing through it anyway. My parents met at Grossinger's in 1950 and in 1950, and my mom was born and raised in, um, in the Bronx. And my dad was scoping for Jewish babes, his words, um, coming up with his brother and, um, and, um, cousin. and, and cousin and some other friends um, from the small town of Tennessee and uh, my my dad saw my mother at at the pool. My mom was visiting a friend of hers who worked at at Grant Gross Singers, and they basically started a courtship that lasted a year. And then they got married, um, you know, having a long distance relationship. And sixty seven years later, you know, had, it was sort of like a Jimmy Carter, Rosalind Carter kind of love story. In any event, uh, so Gross Singers has been very, been very personally meaningful to our family. Um, so I just thank you for this story because it's been legendary. Um, the, the All your work, the, the Gross Singers means a lot to us and our family. And, have photographs. and I have photographs of the day they met at the outdoor pool, but I can't upload them right now. I can't find them. And Brian, I'm trying to remember what my questions are because I came up. Oh, oh, I guess, you know, I was struck by what an absurdly wealthy and well wasteful nation that we are, that people would just abandon these properties. And I'm wondering whether you've researched, um, looked into why each owner just abandoned. It's like, like you said, they just fled. It was like there was some kind of pandemic and they fled rather than trying to sell off sure. the remains or something yeah. like that. Yeah. So I think this is an American epidemic. I don't think yeah. it just yeah in the Borscht Belt. Absolutely. I think, I think we use and discard when we're done with it. it we yeah. suck it up, the hottest thing, we eat it up, and then when we're done with it, we toss it. Um, we see this in 
Detroit, we see this all up and down, um, you know, Massachusetts, places yep. for industry, we see it everywhere. And then the fallout are the locals. Um, there are so many different reasons why, um, but I think, um, I, I can't get into everything, but a lot of the um, kids of the hotel owners, I think, didn't want to run the hotels. Um, there was a lot, it, it was a heavy load to bear. Um, and um, as a result, I think uh, there was always this hope that someone would buy or the area would turn over or there would be gambling or there would be a renaissance or there would be something. And as a result, there was just this lack of um, visitation. So they stopped putting money into the hotels. People stopped coming. Uh, they held on to many till the, they couldn't anymore. And they sold the hotels or they left them abandoned. Or a lot of cases, the abandoned ones were people that bought them intending to do something and then never did. Um, I want to answer Rachel's question really quick because I didn't say that. Borscht. Borscht is a, Europe, is a European soup. It's a beet soup served cold. It was uh, in, an Eastern European uh, cuisine served in many of the hotels. And it was a term that was coined. I'm forgetting the man's name right now. Oh, no, it's too late for me. I have a five-month-old. But um, he coined the term the Borscht Belt, and that was why it was called that. Okay, thanks, Marissa. And actually, I agree with your your. Uh assessment of, of why these buildings were just basically thrown in the garbage. And I visit Detroit often uh, and for the same reason, because it's it's um, a, a textbook case of throwing a, a whole city into the garbage. But um, it's that city is starting to come back. It, uh, buildings which were completely and utterly trashed, the best example being the Michigan Central Railroad Station, which was just uh, vandalized to, to, the, to the nth degree, uh, have been purchased by Ford Motor Company and they're being turned into their headquarters. So, you know, it could still help it happen to the Borscht Belt. But, yeah, um, you know, there, if you, a lot of my images make it seem like not a lot's going on up there, but honestly, it is booming in the summer. It is booming with people who have found it, uh, retro hipsters, vintage boutiques, uh, uh, so many different kind of little towns are springing up. And then it's also booming with the Orthodox who have made it their own vacation destination. So when you go up there, you really get this kind of smorgasbord of different uh styles and vibes and cuisines and yes there are towns that need to kind of uh still revitalize themselves but overall uh there is much to see up there and i encourage you to come see our markers and spend some time well i think you're going to have lots of sca people because you'll read it in the comments people are very interested a please, few more, a please. Few more and check our website for our events we're slowly going to start putting up dates for the marker dedications yeah, a few more questions for you. Uh, do you have any documents, pictures of Brown's Kusha Lane in Loch Sheldrake and its you, address? Yeah, so if you message me, I can get some of my team to see if we can find the early images of the Browns. Uh, the Catskill Institute also has a repository where a lot of these images, they're one of our partners, come from. Um, and you, you can search. So if you send us an email on either my website or the Marker Projects, uh, preferably the Marker Projects, we can try to help you find some more images. Okay, great. Uh, Randy Turner asks, did any of the Borscht Belt hotels spill over the Delaware River to Pennsylvania, north of Port Jervis? So there's like a Pocono, Pennsylvania vacation area, but that was not what is considered Borscht Belt proper. Okay. Philip Langdon asks, did people arrive almost entirely by automobile or did many come by bus or train? Sure. So in the 20s, 30s, 40s, people came by train. Uh, in the 50s, Route 17 was built and they stopped running the railroad. So that was when the car culture, when people started coming up by car. Um, and today you can kind of take a train there. You can definitely take a bus there. You can definitely drive there. And I also have a very good friend who started a concierge service up there called Upstate Detours. And she will drive you around everywhere if you come there. Okay. A very interesting question, um, and I'm not, not finding it right now, but I'll just go from memory. Um, were Gentiles uh, 
allowed to go to these hotels and what would be their reception if they did? Sure. Yeah. Uh, Gentiles were allowed to go. Their hotels offered uh, uh, african Americans. The Black community was allowed to go. Uh, the Borscht Belt really, uh, they didn't shut people out because they were shut out. Um, so while you would predominantly see a Jewish crowd, uh, it was welcoming to all. Um, and um you know, that is really its legacy. And I think a really important thing to keep, um, you know, sustaining is that tolerance and empathy and welcoming and acceptance of all because so many um, are not. Yeah. And I think you mentioned that uh, most of the staff was hired or some of the staff was hired from local people. Uh, so I'm assuming a lot of the local people would have been Gentiles. That was not an issue. A hundred percent. But yep. Uh, a lot, uh, a lot of locals of all demographics, all races, all ages, backgrounds, lifestyles, uh, you name it. Oh, that's great, Marissa. Well, you know what? We're past our time. So I'm going to, there's a, you'll, you'll read all the comments there. Extremely complimentary. And I think that your uh, people will be, uh, there'll be a lot of people visiting your websites. And of course, don't forget that this will be on the SCA's website tomorrow as well. And so a lot of people will watch it there and uh, they'll, <clears throat> including the questions and answers. So they'll have a chance to visit your websites too. Uh, I just like to remind everybody about next month when on Wednesday, January 17th at our usual time of 8 p.m. Eastern, we will accompany Patrick Quinn for a fun and fabulous tour of cocktail culture in the Golden State. Whether you're the type to visit roadside diners, chic hotels, hidden drives, fancy restaurants, or tiki bars, napkin collector Patrick Quinn, author of Bar Keeps, will probably beat you there and he found a vintage cocktail napkin as a souvenir. Mm. Uh, SCA members will be receiving the relevant details and registration links by email and others can register through the SCA website uh, directly. Oh, I just want to mention one thing too. And it's, it's interesting. Our society is called the Society for Commercial Archaeology, Marissa. And we're, this is the archaeology part. Your, your pictures of buildings that no longer exist, just foundations and filled in swimming pools and that. That's, there's very little of the actual archaeology in, in what we do. But this is, an, this is actually a good example of it. Well, thank you. Yeah, you know, in many ways, I feel like an archaeologist because I'm looking for traces of a former time. But unlike an archaeologist, I don't really tamper or, you know, my, my chisel is my camera. <laughs> yes, right. Well, that's great. And also John Margolis was a, a very is a very well known SCA photographer as well. And in fact, um, he was an important part of our society. So, uh, sadly, he's passed on. Um, but uh, we actually auctioned a bunch of his uh, prints, signed prints last summer at our conference and, uh, and they were very popular. I, I wish I could have met him. I feel like we have this uh, kindred connection of both photographing these different moments of the end. Well, if, if you do want to sort of meet him, uh, we had a, a Zoom presentation just like you did about a year ago on, on, his, on him by a woman who had spent a couple of days with him and interviewed him for, uh, for the Chicago Tribune. You can easily, oh, I'll send you the link to it. Uh, um, and if you want to, it, you can check out that, uh, that Zoom presentation. And it's very, very interesting. Anyways, it's getting late. I'd like to thank our guests for uh, spending some time with us tonight. You'll expect an email shortly inviting you to join the SCA if you're not already a member. If you enjoyed all the benefit, if you enjoyed tonight's presentation, and you can enjoy all the benefits of membership, you also will get the links to Amerisa's websites and uh, a, a link to a place where you can make a donation if you're interested in doing that. Uh, and remember that the recording of tonight's presentation will be on our website probably tomorrow. So invite your friends and relatives to watch it there. It's free for everyone. Uh, and um, you can uh, take advantage of that. Marissa, any last words to our good people tonight? No, just thank you again so much for the invite. And thank you everyone for uh, tuning in and um, taking away a little borscht with you. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much. Uh, wish everybody good night. And we'll look forward to seeing you in the new year. Bye.